Uh, my name is Frank McGinnis. I'm a law student. Um, so thank you very much for um, all of your comments on the prison system. But I think one thing that was perhaps alluded to but wasn't developed as fully as it might have been was this um, somewhat trite but also somewhat relevant discussion of like the privatization of what were historically public institutions and the fact that in the 80s, you know, Friedman kind of came along and basically won that whole debate and, and, and sort of proceeded to dismantle the state. And that's what we're witnessing, right? It's like if you turn a prisoner into a product, then that creates a market for that product. And then you're going to get lobbies lobbying for tougher like sentencing so that there are going to be more products so that you can make more money, right? And that's what we're witnessing in this country. That's what we're witnessing in the United States. Um, surely the problem, I know I, I run the risk of sort of undermining my own credibility by doing that whole, oh, let's criticize neoliberalism thing, but isn't it about criticizing neoliberalism and being like, look, the state exists for a reason, um, and we've completely forgotten that and turned it into this like happy little free market where Serco and, and, and all their friends can kind of come along and make money out of people's lives. It's like, that's not a good solution, it doesn't work, and we need to have that conversation and try and wrest that back from, from free gulps kind of thing. So yeah, any um, sort of uh, reactions to my slightly um, I think I think the first thing that this audience might like to consider, and this picks up on the point that Ian made earlier, but perhaps with less experience of the field, is what should happen to individuals once they have been found guilty by a court and sentenced by a court. My proposition, which I invite you to consider, is that the judiciary, whether they are the lay magistrates or the salaried judges, are in a far better position to influence the lives and the future rehabilitation of those whom they have sentenced than prison officers, probation officers, Serco, G4S, or whoever. And the proposition which I invite you just to think about is that the drug court movement, the problem-solving court generally, focuses on one simple proposition which is the relationship that develops between the individual who has been sentenced and the sentencer who reviews that individual on a routine and regular basis. The one thing that comes out from individuals who are in the grip of addiction to drugs and who are seeking to overcome that addiction is they do not want to let their judge down. And that is more powerful, in my view, than anything that a probation officer, let alone a well-meaning prison officer, or an enthusiastic Serco employee can achieve. There's a lady over there who's been there. Um... Hold this against me when I met before you, before the trial board. Um, I have to disagree. I, f I don't feel that the judiciary are the right people to make a decision about what happens to somebody after their sentence, or indeed what the sentence is. I think what um, you said about the Mississippi um, projects and what's happening with probation there is actually very refreshing and something we should be working towards. Um, it all depends, the grassroots of it is, what is prison supposed to be for? Are we looking at rehabilitation? Are we looking at um, protection of the public? Or are we looking at punishment? And when you work out what the reason you're punishing people or sending them to prison is, then we can look at what other options are available. But I would disagree that the judiciary would be the right people to make that decision based on who they are and who the people they're sentencing are and the disparities between their experiences in life. That's not too well. Is there yeah. that and the other point? Can I just say, and I think all those points that you made and another point or problem that I've got with judges, is that very few of them have visited the prison ever, or certainly kind of, you know, in more recent years. I take it that you might know, you mentioned earlier that you have visited prisons. I go to prison about three times a week. How many of your colleagues do that? Well, I'm trying to educate them. Mm. 
Oh, good luck. I think it's absolutely necessary. We do have a lot of judicial members of the parole board. I think there are 98 judges who are members of the parole board. I think the judges should, uh, should be mandatory for judges to visit prisons. Oh, I agree. I agree. I've taken judges into prison uh, on a routine basis to uh, see the education departments of London prisons. And um, some of them find it educational, some of them find it a bit illuminating. Uh, none go away from one of my prison visits saying it's a waste of time. It would be interesting to see how their, um, the, the judgments they pass change after such uh, prison visits. And if we're talking about judges, if I could just make another comment. I actually thoroughly disapprove of um, uh, eccentric judges like the one you described, saying, well, this is my court and I'm uh, I think that I've seen that culture among streets and guards in America, and I think it's problematic. I think it leads to people like that uh, very famous uh, prison warden uh, with the pink underwear. Um, you know what I'm talking about, and similar uh, people just going in and feeling as if that's their little playground. Well, if I might reflect on my experience with judges, not 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 my learned friend uh, to my to my side. Um, and not all judges are the same, not all, not all courts are the same. I, I, I was at Brixton and I, I would occasionally, judges would phone me up. I'm about to sentence, if I did this, this and this, would this happen? And I used to say, no it won't. Um, would anything happen? I said, no it probably won't. Um, I had one judge who hauled me before him um, because I was sending prisoners, uh, they weren't getting to court on time. Um, many of them don't, didn't want to go at all, so I, I was summoned, I did insist on a uh, a barrister and a solicitor to defend me, which wasn't wasn't the norm. Um, and I said, well, you know, I'll, in, I'll investigate. He, he actually came to the prison, um, spent a day in the prison, and afterwards he said, I don't know how you get anybody to court <laughs> ever. Um, so it, it's it's there. But I would, uh, in terms of, uh, and, and John's know, John knows my view on this. I I tend to agree with him. I would go further, um, and I would. Uh, you know, we're in a commercial world and, uh, you know, finances and profit and so on. I, I would be giving judges the budget for their disposals. I would say to judge, if, all right, there are a range of things you can do to solve the problem. And, and I think this is what they're, what they're doing. Some things are very expensive. Solitary confinement is very expensive. Prison is very expensive. Other things are less expensive. Treatment is less expensive. So let them be part of the problem solving, but in, in doing so, let them have the budget because I don't know of any other walk of life where people make decisions that don't have any financial consequences, uh, and, and judges, judges are there. But, uh, but I'm with John in terms of the whole issue of, of solving problems, because this is what I, these are what the issues are, that they're, they're solving problems rather than, yes, there are issues about punishment and retribution and deterrence. For me, they're, they're not prison problems, they're community problems that prisons and courts should be trying to solve. John, can I, can I just ask a question? If you'll let me, allow me to ask a question. But why does prison cost forty-one thousand pounds per prisoner? Where, where does the money go? The accommodation it's, is it's because, because as, I said, as I said earlier, we are obsessed with security. Um, we lock up eight, eighty-three thousand. Now, if you release some of the way. that much just to lock people up? Well, well it does. But, but no, let, let me explain. It's a gate in the wall. <laughs> it's prison officers. 85% of any prison budget are prison officers. Um, there are going to be fewer and fewer of those, but that would still be bought with the cost. But if you look at the prison system that we've got, we've got 83,000 people in prison. Now, we release somewhere between 60 to 80,000 people a year, such as the turnover. So at any one time, more than half the prison population is about to go out. So they're probably not likely to want to escape. Most of them have got nowhere to go anyway. How many resettlement prisons have we got? If, we're on, if, if our main task is resettlement, um, how many resettlement prisons have we got? We've got two. Um, they're now talking about 70, and, and fine, maybe Grayling's read my book, um, we should be going down that, we be going down that road. But, but we, we are obsessed with security, we over-securitise the system, and by doing so, we waste vast amounts of money. Locking people up is the easiest thing in the world. We can do it very, very easily. It's the most expensive thing. It's getting people out that's the difficult bit. Escaping from prison is dead easy. You saw it in Salford a few weeks ago. 
You know, um, we spend a fortune on the prison perimeter, but we take people to court in a van run by Serco, two elderly guys on minimum wage, you flag it with a shotgun. It's dead easy. Boring debating question that there ever is. Mm -hmm. And I find it so tedious that people on the left instantly say everything private is bad, and people on the right instantly say everything on the state, run by the state is bad. All we should be looking for is what is the best solution? Who delivers the best service? Uh, and that's what matters. It could be private, it could be public. It doesn't really matter. It's about what is the best service. And yeah, if there is a private um, incarceration industry, they will be lobbying for, for their interests. Of course they will. And the job of government is to stop them. But the idea you shouldn't make money out of this. I mean, three of the people on the panel make their living out of, out of uh, crime and, and such things. Uh, I think it's just absurd. It's just been looking for the best <laughs> solutions to the problems that we have. And it doesn't matter who provides them. And I, I hear exactly the same, I'll just come back to the health service, we get exactly the same in the health service, where there's this idea in Britain that, pub, that private medicine is a sort of some kind of evil. You know, I've got a very badly disabled child. The state provision has been absolutely pathetic, as it is for 70% of the people who rely on it, of the old and disabled, who get a really bad service. And the only thing that's improved is allowing us to run the budget, and we can choose how to spend it. Some of it is state-run, and it's fantastic. Some of it is private, and it's fantastic. You know, let's not be so myopic, let's just look for the best solutions instead of having philosophical barriers that get in the way of it, whether you're on the left or the right. And I would take an utterly different perspective on that. And it, it seems to me that the sad thing I found about what you said is this notion that somehow Milton Friedman won the debate. History is a lot longer than that. History is, is, is a lot more than the last 20 years. And it seems to me and what I find utterly bizarre about um, the approach of many politicians to the world is that we all basically agree on the general parameters of what our ideal society looks like. And it's going to include health care for everyone. It's going to include a good education for everyone. Our ideal society is going to include in decreasing numbers of prisons till ultimately there are none, and so on and so forth. And we're never going to achieve utopia, obviously, by definition. But we know what our ideal is. What's extraordinary to me is that we let politicians get away with making decisions that pretend that you can get closer to your ideal society by going in the wrong direction. The world is way simpler than most people seem to view it as. And you don't get closer to your better society by having more prisons. That's just inane. Any more than you get closer to your ideal society by having a less equal society. And frankly, Ian and I will probably have to disagree on that. I view the world as obviously a trend towards equality and decency, which used to be summed up in one word, socialism. And ultimately, we'll get back to all of that. We'll call it something different. And I wish indeed you'd help me out, because I plan to write a diatribe about this sometime. And I want a new word so we can seize the language back. But these troughs and um, crests of, of life but just the way it goes, and, and things may be going badly on one issue today, we're going to get it back. We're only going to get it back if you stop being so depressive about it and get out there and do something. Maybe if you're talking about a new word, the new word that we need to create is present. Because when an individual needs to be incarcerated, that's fine that individual will be incarcerated by the state for the protection of other citizens of the state. But that is a very, very tiny minority of individuals. The problem that I and other judicial officers always face when we do not impose a custodial sentence is that the vast majority of right-thinking citizens so that that individual walks free, not so. If we can devise a means of imposing the sanction of society for those who have broken the law in one form or another, but who do not, in the interest of society, need to be locked up, then we will create a new language. But this polarization of view, the binary system of prison on the one hand and walking free on the other, perpetuates a system 
in which rehabilitation, to me, seems to be due. Just make one brief point. I think that we're facing some quite interesting times now because not only we're going to get Vicky Price's uh, memoir, um, I think we have somewhere between 20 and 30 news international journalists who have been arrested. Um, what imagine they consider a portion there? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm just checking the numbers with you. There's going to be a big upsurge in middle class concern about penal policy. I promise you. you put it. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I, I have two questions for all of you. Just very simple. Why do you all think that uh, President Obama is not closing one time low? And the second one is talking about the sanction of society. You just think that there will never be a, a criminal, international criminal court that will judge his these days, I think, lists to take out who's got to be killed with drones and all the collateral damage. I would very much appreciate to have your opinion on that. Thank you. Who would like to go on this? No, I would. You're just trying to provoke me, aren't you? But no, I've been to Guantanamo 27 times. It is a god-awful place. And um, the reason Obama hasn't closed it is because he's basically naive. I should say that if I were president of the US, unlikely to happen, I would screw up the country far worse than him. But his approach to it, and, and it was confirmed to me by a friend of mine who works in the White House, is that he thought it was so blindingly obvious that Guantanamo was shocking. You know, and I listen to all these criticisms of the British system, boy, it's just over a million dollars each for the prisoners in Guantanamo each year, and look what they get for that. But what Obama thought he could do is persuade people that he was right, he set up a committee. The Republicans were actually only interested in one thing, which was a divisive political issue, and they were very effective at dividing. And when, when Obama came into office, we had had so much fun beating up on Bush for several years that 65% of Americans wanted to close Guantanamo down. Because Obama hasn't fought his corner, and the Republicans have, today 60% of Americans want to keep it open. Nothing's changed except people have made the argument and, and he hasn't done it. Now, the way we're going to close it down, because just like burning witches at the stake, history is not going to speak kindly about Guantanamo, we're going to close it down by what you do because it's the court of public opinion that's way more important than the court of law. Fifth, of the five, first 500 prisoners released, the courts ordered the release of zero, and we got 500 people out by publicizing what was really going on there. And this hunger strike right now, much as my poor clients are suffering daily, uh, is incredibly important uh, in order to get this back on the map so we can uh, get him to close it down. And you know, I hate to see these people suffering, but it's our job to publicize what they're doing. Now, drones... Is it having a difference? Yeah, it's it is really having... Really a, and it's having a big difference. And you know, we, had, we published in the New York Times, not bad by one of my clients from Yemen. It was the most read article in the, in the paper that day. And two days later at a press conference, Obama was confronted with it. And for the first time in several years, he had to talk about it. And now he's having a major speech next Thursday about what he plans to do with Guantanamo. Suddenly, Harold Coe and Aunt Hillary Clinton have announced that they've given him plans as to how to close it. Well, you know, about time. Isn't it? Yeah, look, it will happen eventually, but it'll only happen if we keep stirring up trouble. So I want you to go down to the US Embassy with a big bath full of blood or something, while they're in it for a few days. Whatever you can do, start selling death penalty insurance to people traveling to America so when they go there, they can have a defense when they go to Guantanamo, whatever. Now, drones, when I first went to Guantanamo, I got into an argument with a Republican guy who said, oh, you commie, you know, if you insist on legal rights for these bastards, we'll just kill them. And I laughed at him and thought, you barbarian. Yeah. In fact, I said that. Um, and we got on very jolly. But that's, of course, what they're doing. But don't think they're going to get away with it. We are so onto them. And it's really great fun. I've been down to Waziristan with uh, Imran Khan, and we did our little thing last year. And it's awful what's going on down there. But the real problem is people don't know what's going on down there. So your job is to piss off to Waziristan and go, you can go there. I've been there. It's no big deal. It was um, by far the most dangerous thing about going there was the Pakistani drivers, frankly. And try and know. Well, anyway, I won't go into the other issues, which is, no, I won't tell you. 
I'm being slightly molested by some Pashtuns who, uh, who were giving me the squeeze. I, I really thought they were pickpocketing me for a while, but it wasn't true. But anyway, the, um, the, you know, our challenge is to get the facts out there and to get it out there in a way that people care. And there are exponential numbers of ways you can do it. I, one thing I'd like you to do is in your little village, I plan to do this in my village, is put a little sign up there in the Pashtun that says, tonight we're going to drone you and kill all your children. There's no one will know what it means, but they'll get in a big panic because it's in something that looks like Arabic. So finally, they'll work out what it means and they'll call the police. And that'll get in the front page of the papers tomorrow. And perhaps, in between you being arrested, um, they'll, they'll, someone will start talking about what they're doing to children in, in, in Waziristan and so forth. But we have to think imaginatively about ways that we get the truth out there. And then we have to go after them. We already ran the U.S. ambassador out of Pakistan. It was so much fun. He announced, they announced in the Washington, and not Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, that every time they do a drone strike in Pakistan, he, they have to ask the, the ambassador whether he thinks it's okay. So, you know, this is insanity. Yeah. So we took out a warrant for his arrest because he's committing a criminal act of, of murder, yeah. conspiracy to commit murder. He left the country. And he was then quoted in the New York Times saying, I didn't realize my job as ambassador was to kill people. So by doing things in what one hopes is a sort of lateral imaginative way, you can really screw with these people in power. And it's great fun doing it. So get on with it. I'm on, on the cost here. I've got one minute uh, left with uh, all you guys. I'm, I don't think we can. Can you do it in a minute? You certainly can. Thank you to everyone for talking to us. My, my name is Jonathan Robinson. I'm an ex-prisoner. I'm, I'm the guy that wrote a book, and there's been quite a lot of book plugging going on this evening. So I'll just get my uh, foot at the door there. Just a very quick one. Does the panel know how long American prison officers, prison officers, are trained for per se? And I did not include Guantanamo Bay in that. John, no idea. No. It's got to be a lot longer than six weeks. Uh, this, 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 is, this is my point. This debate is about what we can learn from the American uh, prison system. Uh, in this country, prison officers are trained for six weeks. In Norway, it's two years. Compare the real numbers. Right. Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, you, your brother, the poet. You said you wanted to read some of his poetry. Would that embarrass you, or do you want to? Yeah. No, I, have, I wanted to talk about Slavic, actually, like, um, which is that um, as much as we talk about them, Tamino, like they are—they they are just extensions of the U.S. domestic supermax system, and they'd be impossible. Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo Bay, there would be unimaginable about everything. Forced cell, cell extraction, force feeding that occurs in the domestic supermax system. People having terrorism trials within the United States, let's take some names like the Holy Land Five, 65 Years in Communication Management Unit. No one knows their names, um, they're not. That's probably going to be the fate of my brother. Right? If you, and even the, with extradition, like you're having people detained in this country for up to 14 years without trial or charge. We have Guantanamo Bay at home in Belmarsh and Latin, and um, strikes preceding Guantanamo Bay, Pelican Bay. Um, uh, and so forth. Um, so the Guantanamo, the Bosch Guantanamo is just one step in, in, in the right direction. Um, I can end it with that. Very quickly. I'll move. I'll move. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So this is a poem my brother wrote in prison, and it's Gareth Pierce's favourite poem by my brother. And uh, Bruce Kent is the best poem about faith in prison, and it's called This Be the Answer. And this is on sale outside, sorry. <laughs> so, this, this be the answer. A prisoner on his knees scrubs around a toilet bowl, and the bristles of the brush scuttles to and fro, as a guard swaggers over to yell rather than ask, Where is your God now? And the prisoner, still on his knees, his brush still cleaning, answers, He is with me now, Gov. My God is with me now. Hearing and seeing, whilst your superiors, when they see you, do not look at you, and when they hear you, do not listen to you. My God is risen above the heavens and closer to me than my jugular vein, whilst your superiors, no different to you, allow you no further than the desk. My God wants me to call him whilst your superiors demand you knock, and when I go towards him a handspan, he comes to me a yard, and when I go to him walking, he comes to me a running. 
Ignorance is cured by knowledge and the key to knowledge is to ask. Less now the explanation mark and more a question mark. The guard sulks away and the prisoner on his knees, still as if in prayer.